most of the songs are sort of almost written to me. <laughs> like, as, like anything that has a lesson in it is basically me trying to tell myself, like, uh, it's, it's like self-therapy almost. Welcome to the Ad Podcast. I'm your host, Justin McRoberts. A few nights ago, I took my newborn daughter, who was crying at the time, into the small office space where I do most of my work, including recording and editing this podcast. I deftly navigated my laptop while holding her in the other arm, and I started playing through some of my favorite songs. We listened to Sig Gross and Jonesy and Ilex and Josh Ritter and Kendrick Lamar and some of the older Tribe Cult Quest and stuff. I could feel her body and breathing change with the music. She was captured, as are most people, by the incredible gift we've been given in this art form. You know, she's only 12 days old at the time of this recording and surely you won't remember this moment, but I still put my face close to hers and whispered, this is music. It might be the best thing we've done as humans. There's something physical emotional as well as spiritual about the human connection to song. My guest on this episode is Ryan O'Neill, whose work bears the name Sleeping At Last. Ryan's an artist who is keenly and intentionally aware of that unique connection between listeners and the music they love. Truth is, not all artists share that awareness. I think you'll enjoy hearing about his process, his vocational journey, and the way he considers those for whom he's making music. Check it out. Ryan. Hey, Justin, how are you? I'm doing great, man. How about yourself? I'm doing very well. Let me, uh, are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, awesome. For some reason, I have a, oh my gosh, okay. I have some uh, pizzicato strings happening in the background, and I can't figure out where it's playing on my computer, but I just found it. <laughs> well, that could be a really cool moment for you. I mean, you could, like, you, like you yeah, could, right? <laughs> you'd have your own kind of, um, like, emotional peaks and valleys during this conversation. <laughs> be like, it you really seem to like... tear up during the conversation about <laughs> yeah, the bass guitar. I don't know why. It was just, like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's almost like he has his own me. thing going on. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool. I, I need to work on that. You should have, like, an app. Constantly, uh, I can I can press whatever emotion is happening. That's actually not the worst idea. <laughs> Where like you're going into a social situation, you know you're not going to have the right emotional angle, and you yeah. kind of have to get there. So it's like, like, please, please bring me empathy. You need the empathy Here's track. Right. Totally. <laughs> Think around to something. Yeah. I, if only we really actually had the time to put something like that together. I know, right? I know. So you're still in Chicago. That's, uh, I am. I'm still in Chicago, and it's uh, it's super, super gray and, and gross here. <laughs> well, I'm in Northern California. It's kind of gray and gross here, too. So w- when I say still, did you ever uh, – like you uh, – have you left sh- the Chicago area and then come back, or have you just – you stuck it out, and that's home, and that's never changed? I have technically stuck it out here, yeah. So I've been I've been in Chicago from uh, from day one, but there was, a, there was about a year or two period where – I traveled a ton to LA and was was kind of not not really living out there, but I was looking for a place out there. So that was that was the original trajectory, and then uh, we ended up finding a house uh, here in town that we loved. So we, we ended up staying. My wife and I stayed in uh, stayed in Glen Ellen, Illinois. Oh, cool. Yeah. How far is that actually from downtown Chicago? That's like actually half hour outside. Yeah, it's like without traffic, probably forty five minutes, and then with traffic, you know, an hour hour and ten minutes. Yeah. Yeah, so not terrible, but we we like it. I, I grew up like within 10, 15 minutes from here, and um, so it, it feels very much like home. And I do think that there's something that happens with the seasons that is is healthy for you in some in some huh. capacity to kind of experience the the you know to look forward to spring, <laughs> yeah, and to any warmth whatsoever. So so yeah, so I I, I like it. I, I still have my heart sort of is still in the in California and the on the coast a little bit. I I love the ocean, so it's hard to it's hard to be so far from it. But it means I get to travel quite a bit to see it. So that's that works out. Is and having like tried the L.A. thing, was it like you were gonna try to find a place and then you was there was it a cultural thing? Was it like you missed the seasons? You missed family? Like what drew you back to Chicago or where? It was actually kind of circumstance. So we we were out there for a little while trying to find a place to rent or buy, and I think about maybe five or six houses that we had our sights on just fell through. It's such an intense market that we. uh, 
we didn't we just couldn't we couldn't get our like hands around something so we huh. we ended up taking like a year off to kind of just like recoup and i could get back to working on music and right. and all that here in here in town and then we uh we kind of stumbled on the house that we're in now that we uh we kind of fell in love with so we it was it was not our plan to stay here but we we're really glad we did at the since since that was about three or four years ago and since we did we we started having our our we, we have two daughters now and so now we're we're pretty thankful where we are where we are it would be different to raise kids in Southern California. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure it'd be amazing too. But I, it feels—I mean, I know exactly what a childhood here looks like because I had one. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. yeah. it feels like yeah, I, that makes sense. I, I I like I like the idea of of our kids knowing you know Chicago, but then also kind of being central in the in the country to go go wherever anytime we want. You know. Yeah, that's pretty cool. You have a two year old, yeah. and then you have a newborn. Exactly. Yeah, we have a. She's coming up on four months here in, in a few days, and yeah, so it's it's been a, it's been a very busy few months. <laughs> That's really great. Yeah, we've got my wife. I've got a six, almost six, well, six and a half year old, and then I've got okay. a, and I've got a. Uh, we have she. My wife is. We are not pregnant. My wife is pregnant. I'm responsible for that. Uh, and, you had something to do with it. Yeah, yeah. That's what I've been told. And then. Uh, <laughs> And and we're having a daughter in uh, in April, which would be a oh whole, congratulations! Yeah, I'm I'm pretty stoked about it. Having a boy has been really great, and then all my all my yeah. all my friends who have girls are like, it's cool that you've had a first kid, and it's great that it's been a boy, but you haven't had a daughter yet. <laughs> and so yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. So I I only know the daughter path, but it is it is pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like I yeah we we for some reason we we had like this real intense feeling that our second was going to be a boy. So when we found out it was a girl, we were super surprised. And I'm I'm very 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 thankful. I think that the the sister relationship is a lot of fun, and mm. um and so we're we're very very happy. But it would be I think I think that there's definitely a, a quality to each each little little character. Yeah, <laughs> that we, yeah, that we right. Get. Um, so but yeah, you're in, you're in for a treat though. I I'm I'm looking forward to it for the most part. I I know there will be some <laughs> things that aren't great, but uh but yeah. I mean, being in a dad's been literally without question. I mean, people say it right. They're like, oh, it's the best thing ever. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. okay, yeah, fine. And then you're a dad, and you're like, oh snap, this is legitimately the best thing ever. Like, is that that's really actually is it really thing. is actually the best. Like, they weren't they weren't. And it's, I, I find that like every single thing that everybody tells you before you become a parent, like, oh, it's the hardest thing in the world. It's the best thing in the world. Like, it all actually is true. <laughs> like, yeah, it's just right. all is simultaneously true because it is. It represents like the hardest stuff, you know, the hard, like the most tiring, most exhausting, whatever phase I've ever gone through. And then also the most incredible, beautiful, inspiring, you know, it kind of is, it, it really is everything. I, this is actually one of the spaces in life in which like having a philosophy degree actually am, ended up being helpful because I, I started to recognize oh, what I was in as a parent as an archetypal experience. That oh, it's, interesting. That it's not the it's the kind of thing you can pair other things to. So, like in other words, like people say, I, "Oh, yeah, yeah. being a coach, you know, it's like being a parent." But you can't say that being a parent is like being a coach. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's like, true. It's like it, really it, it's, it is one hundred percent. It's its own thing. It is an archetypal experience, and it's the thing like to which you can pair other elements and uh, and moments and and practices in life. And so that's why I stopped paying attention to try to how do I capture this. And, and and just like there are just those moments you just you're in this and you it yeah. is way bigger than you and it's way better than you know and you just have to kind of live there and love it and that's uh, yeah, I totally you know that's those are that's seriously the beautiful language for it I, I keep finding that like it it having kids is the ultimate mirror you know you see like everything wrong with yourself yes right. <laughs> while you while you're trying to show up for another person you're like oh my gosh like well, I am super selfish <laughs> like it's, it's why so am I getting irritated with this or why am I you know like why am I tired when I should be happy you know like all these all these emotions are constantly it's a it's a constant check for me which is good You started out. I mean, Sleeping at Last started as a trio. It was you and your brother and a and and a, and a drummer. Uh, or was your brother the drummer? Yep. Yeah, my brother is the drummer, and then Dan, our uh, my my really good friend, is uh, he was the keyboard slash bassist. And so, starting as a band, and now you you pretty much as Sleeping at Last, you function pretty much solo as Sleeping at Last. Yep. Um, 
do you like does it feel like a continuation like historically in other words does it feel like that was sleeping at last and this is sleeping at last or does it feel like somewhere along the lines there was like this is a completely different animal and being in the band was something else like what's the relationship there historically yeah so the name sleeping at last has been around for quite a while i think it's been uh 1999 when i when i named my band that yeah (laughs) and so so that stuck with me and the reason that like when when chad went off to do his thing and then dan went off to do his thing the reason i kind of decided to keep going with the name was because i was always the songwriter and these were always like such personal songs that i felt like it would be weird to start a new book with the same story being told, you know? Huh. So I, um, so I kept the name and I kept the kind of just kept moving forward and right, right. I think when Dan parted ways, he, we were right in the middle of uh, my yearbook project, which was kind of the beginning of this new, this new, uh, direction for my music and for the release format and kind of everything was changing right around that time. So it was a really natural progression into kind of doing things on my own. I, I've always written songs on my own. And so, um, and because it's become more and more about writing and recording, I think it was, mm. it was even more of a natural transition to, yeah. we used to tour quite a bit more than, than I do now. And, right. Um, so yeah, so it, I, I decided like, it's, it's my journal. I got to keep writing in it. <laughs> yeah. So for folks who don't know the, the yearbook project, can you like, cause it, it does sort of mark a pretty significant shift uh, and there is sort of like a there's sort of a seed of the next several years in the yearbook project. Can you break down a little bit about what you were doing with that project and how it ended up yeah. happening? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this was probably around 2010. I decided that I just I, I kind of got tired of the the format of like writing and recording a record every three years and then touring in between. For some reason, I think like returning to the writing process every time just felt scary and vulnerable and weird because I had so much time away from it and. I think I, I was just kind of doing some, you know, uh, just kind of figuring out, like asking these questions in my career right before that started and was like, what, what part of making music is my favorite part? Like, is it the touring? Is it the live shows? Is it the writing and recording? And it was definitely writing and recording. I just, I love the creativity. I love the the vulnerability and the, the, I just, it, the, the craft of songwriting has always been a huge passion of mine. So um, so I, I just kept thinking like, okay, well, what can I do to, you know, I'm an independent musician, like a, no, no label is going to tell me I can't do it. So what, what can I do to try something new? And so I really, it was just a creative challenge to kind of start this idea of, I'm going to record three songs every month, write and record three songs every month, um, for a year. So 36 songs in total, uh, each little EP that came out at the first of every month would be named after the month that was released. And it was it was just kind of like a, this creative challenge. I before that I would write maybe like five songs every year. Mm-hmm. It was a very slow process. So I just wanted to I wanted to challenge myself and just try to become a better songwriter and try to just you know um, just put my head down and, and only write for a year and just see. I figured the goal was like I'm either gonna totally crash and burn <laughs> and won't be able to get through all 36 songs or I'll finish all of them and I'll be a better songwriter either way. So yeah. um, that was that, kind of the beginning of it. And it, like I said, it started as just like a creative challenge for myself. And then that yearbook project has informed everything I've done since. So I'm, I'm working on a project now called Atlas, which is kind of a, a long form uh, concept album. It's It's over many, many, many songs over several years. And it kind of tells like a one greater story. So that's kind of what I'm working on now, but it all started with the, with yearbook and just trying to write and record as many songs as, as I felt was, was doable. satisfying creative project I've ever 
uh, I've ever been a part of. And um, well, I mean, I guess technically all of the the series of music I'm doing now are, are feel that way. But um, yeah. it was the start of that for me, and that was really yeah, you kind of found you kind of found a little bit of a, like this is how I want to make because that's part of the like that's part of the part of the creative process for folks that you you know maybe we we don't think as as much about. We it's like there's the thing you want to make, and yeah. then and oddly enough the the how you get there part of it man the it, it almost gets skipped over or it's taken for granted i mean like i've been to songwriting workshops and 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 or songwriting retreats and listened to you know veteran songwriters be asked yeah. questions about their process and they can't answer the question they end up talking about like the inspiration behind the song but they can't <laughs> right. but they can't get from like i saw a puppy on the side of the road to here's the song like there's no there's nothing in between it's like i saw this puppy the puppy had three legs and then there was this song <laughs> and it's like yeah but there's all this stuff that happened in between bro and, and part of what there's you're getting after is like yeah <laughs> actually creating a creating a system the challenge here of like hey i'm gonna put out 36 songs sort of it squeezes stuff out of you that like you know you now have a format to keep up with and there's an actual process for your creativity which is like super key did you have any of the yeah, 36 absolutely. songs like did you like how much of, of that you know of that yearbook project did you have at least like in seedling when you started so the idea originally was like i was i was gonna before i even announced it i was gonna try to write like at least at least uh you know five or six songs to kind of get started in case i in case this whole thing kind of fails <laughs> so uh, that was the goal and then of course as uh, as always happens with me if uh if it's not a deadline that i've i've announced and promoted i just it, it just always gets pushed back so by the time the actual project started i had only I think I was working on the the first song, <laughs> and that was it. So no no extra. Really good. I, yeah, it was right away. The cushion was completely taken away. So <laughs> so so yeah. So the every I think the the it started in October. So October first was the first three song EP came out, and then November first. So as soon as October second rolled around, I was working on that November EP. <laughs> and wow. It was it was definitely like I I was already disappointed in myself that I totally blew the deadline of that. Um, but I I. I, I kept to, I don't think I was late. And I, there might've been at the very, very end, like a song or two that got late because of a, like a TV project I had to work on. Um, but overall I kept to the, kept to that system and that it really was like, yeah, like that, that format of like, I've announced it. People have subscribed yeah. to the idea. So I know that I'm going to let people, some, somebody down. It's not just myself that I'm letting down. And that was, that was a really big like fire under my butt to, yeah. <laughs> to keep writing. And I hit, I hit writer's block probably every other song that's good <laughs> where i was just <laughs> like really oh good. no that's it that was the last that was the last creativity i have in me um and it, that project taught me that like oh okay if you if you really do keep your butt in the chair longer yeah you will find something like you, you can't run out of things to say <laughs> well there really man there really is something to be said for <clears throat> deadlines and for limitation one of the I, i've got this uh like I'll coach songwriters or writers or creatives and, and part of the part of what I get after with with some of the people I help is like creating some limitation to work with tends yeah. like tends to draw stuff out of you that you couldn't get if you just have this un like unlimited amount of time like I'll get it done when I get it done like yeah like that kind of gives me me the permission to get out of the seat uh, but like having yeah, the deadline kind of you know you actually do really good work when it you know you have to make some decisions that you wouldn't make you settle on things you make the you know you 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 try stuff that you wouldn't try there really is something about limitation that like spurns creativity on like maybe I really else. think so yeah and I don't I don't know if it works for everybody at least uh, I know from just in my experience that like if I have if I have a prompt and and a deadline those are like the two greatest like assets for my creativity and by a prompt I mean like right now I'm working on the Atlas project and for every song it's already been mapped out. So there's already a theme for every song. So I'm starting, uh, like for example, I did five songs for the five senses. So when I was working on those songs, I knew I was working on the sense of sight. So I knew that this song had like, without having any idea what it was going to be about or how it was going to work, I knew that I had a starting point of like, okay, huh. the song is about sight. So let's do some research. Let's try to figure out what that means. Let's try to figure out some sort of like, what, how does that resonate with me uh, and my sense of sight? And so like, like that, like you that begin with thematic parameters. Like, like this is where yeah. the song has to exist is like, it can't end up writing about, 
like you know like the way the ocean feels or whatever you have to be this is about seeing yes exactly this is it has to and obviously the whole project is like an interpretation of all these themes that i'm talking about but it is it it, it start it's a starting place and that's so so helpful for me i know there's a couple of other writers that i've talked to that don't feel that way that like having restrictions is sort of like the that's the most terrifying thing for them is like, Oh no, I have to write a song about this, like on command. But for me, like the blank page or the blank canvas is, is truly the most terrifying thing in the world to me. Yeah. <laughs> like it has to, there has to be some sort of footing, uh, for me to feel like, okay, yes, this makes it. And I actually have found the same to be true of like, that's why I enjoy, uh, film scoring a little bit more, um, which is something I've done in the last, uh, last few years. So I'm, I'm brand new at it, but what I really, really love about it is you see the visuals and then you try to put sound to it and it's yeah. it's an automatic response. Like this doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Like that's that totally is ruining whatever is happening on the screen. Or yeah, that that chord for some reason makes sense here, you know? Yeah. So um and the same that, that same rule kind of applies in, in this like thematic concept I'm working on. Dear true love, a writer without any words. A story that nobody heard When I'm without you I am a voice I am a voice without any sound I'm a treasure map that nobody found When I'm without role of visuals in your work again something that seems to have really uh found some footing in uh, the yearbook project because part of the yearbook project is i don't remember if you had multiple folks submitting pieces for artwork but there was like there was a really clear and intentional relationship between the songs and the visuals that went with each release yeah 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 yeah, totally. So um, for the art, at least on, on your book, I, there's one painter named Jeff Benzing that, um, so basically he would, he would let me boss him around and I'll just be like, okay, this next month is coming up. And um, each, each piece of art had something to do with like a, like kind of a natural, not a natural wonder, but something that happens in nature around the world that I wanted to kind of represent that was sort of somehow connecting to the songs I'm working on. So he would just let me um, boss him around and say like, Hey, the monarch butterflies that fly across, you know, the states. I want that, <laughs> and so he'll, he'll be painting that while I'm while I'm trying to write those songs for whatever month that was, um, and yeah. So the the artwork kind of was a was a was a fun collaboration. But the visuals, yeah, like visual for some reason, I think I was thinking about that recently. Where I, like I don't know why um, I don't know why like I, writing to me is such a visual process. Like the lyric writing, like I can't. I can't really make sense of words unless I can see what I'm trying to explain, if that makes sense. So, um, you mean, in other words, like, like see, like in terms of actually seeing words on paper or on a screen? No, like actually like it's the thing that I'm trying to explain. Oh, it's <laughs> so okay. It's, it's, it's kind of weird. So yeah, it's almost like a, like I'm trying to, um, I don't know, I'm trying to show a picture of something without being able to, somebody being able to see it. So I'm trying to describe yeah. it in every way possible. And I think that that like visual approach to writing came from, I just, I, I fell in love with film and TV as a kid. <laughs> so hmm. I just, more so than, than books. And I would, I would just completely immerse myself in like cinematic worlds. And so for me, like everything, everything artistic or emotional some somehow kind of starts in that visual space and yeah. so when it came to like writing lyrics i was like oh yeah they make sense when i try to explain the things i'm seeing in my head <laughs> oh cool so are yeah, you so cool. which then kind of takes you <clears throat> takes me to this in terms of like your your process you know, we, I, I, I would joke around with other uh with other songwriters or whatever about the the, the sort of perpetual question musical lyrics first we were we were at, we were yeah, to think yeah. called the <laughs> it's called the festival of faith in music uh at calvin college and uh, yeah. one of like one of my favorite bands at the time was was there performing this evening show, and uh, we, like was looking forward to meeting and talking with the the the, the front man, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and the literally there was a kid in the crowd you know the crowd like fifty people before the show <coughs> sit down and talk to these guys Grammy award winning band and, and the kid in the front row goes so do you do the music or the lyrics first? And that's, <laughs> and that's the question that let out. Here's what was funny about it was like, everyone was like, Oh, like that question. But 
he picked it up <laughs> and he started talking about like, well, you know, we can joke around about the question, but reality is like you end, you end up doing, you do have to end up starting from somewhere. You have some, yeah, exactly. You and, have some sort of starting so, place. So like we, we pretend like that's a stupid question, but it's not really. It's just, it's just <laughs> everyone pretends like they've got their, their stuff wired. So for you yeah. in terms of, you know, especially again, coming back to the, to the yearbook project and everything since then, do you find yourself having a, like a, a regular process with a, with a pretty consistent starting point? Like what's it look like? Can you take me from zero to like a completed song? What's that look like yeah. often for you? Yeah, absolutely. So every, I'm, as you know, it's, it's always different and never, never goes by the same recipe, but I've learned like there's, there's definitely definite practices that I can put into place that, that will help me kind of at least, be in the right posture to to write a song. Um, so for me, it starts with <clears throat> with trying to record everything that I'm doing every day. Like I mean, that sounds super vague, but uh, so I'll sit down at the piano intentionally, maybe for an hour or so a day. I would uh, that's that's the goal. I, I often don't get get to it, but I'll try to like when I'm when I'm just this isn't even when I'm in writing mode it's just all the time I try to spend like an hour a day on the piano or a guitar or whatever and I'll just play around just for fun without any intention mm -hmm. and then if something kind of appears where there's like a chord that I like that day or whatever I just press record on my iPhone and then I kind of keep keep these little tiny recordings of these total terribly performed ideas <laughs> and most of which are awful yes um and then what's kind of awesome about it is that like I forget about because I record so much that I just forget about what I actually recorded, you know, a week ago. So I'll go back through these recordings and I'll I'll kind of have that like completely um, separated point of view. Like I'll be able to be like, yeah, that I, th oh, that's interesting. I really like there's something in that in that progression or there's something in those chords that makes sense um, objectively, <laughs> you know, um, that I feel like it, it could be could be something and so the same thing happens with lyrics I, I try to free write every day and it's kind of kind of similar to the um the artist way the morning pages concept but i, I will yeah. try to write just if, even if it's a word i like that just makes sense today i'll, I'll just kind of keep keep um recording those things and are, 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 are you free writing but are you uh, is that a handwritten <laughs> thing are you using a keyboard how are you doing that it's kind of either but mostly it's in this app called um uh what is it called journal one no day one day one um and that that is like pretty much like a it, it, syncs up with my iPhone and my computer and my everything. Um, and so it, it's basically meant as a journal. So I kind of treat it as a, as a journal slash lyric writing thing. So I, I, I'm not really like going in and journaling how I'm feeling. It's more just like free writing, like anything that's comes to my mind, terrible or otherwise. <laughs> yeah. And so the same thing kind of happens there where I can go back through those, those journal entries and just kind of, uh, like if, if there's a melody in mind um, from those recordings or uh, that's usually where it starts. I have to find something in those recordings that that, that sticks out and then I'll kind of uh, I'll, I'll pick up where I left off and kind of figure out how to play a little bit further, maybe write a verse or, or whatever, whatever that turns into. And then I'll go back through those lyrics and, and those little random words and see like, OK, what what like thematically makes sense or if I'm if I am working on a theme that's specific like what what fits along with that theme hmm. and then I'll kind of just piece it all together um in you know a matter of a couple of weeks so once, so there's once kind of there really, there, there's the like song, there's kind of a piecing like you're talking like you've got little slivers and chunks around and you're, you're exactly. kind of, it's a little bit of a Frankensteining thing going on there there's you, a little bit yeah for sure and you uh, that I would say 98% of all of my song recordings or like music recordings and then 98% of my uh, my actual like lyric journal entries are totally terrible and I don't use them. Huh. <laughs> but, but every once in a while, it, whether it's like the start of something new or um, even like if I'm stuck and I have a verse already in mind and I'm just looking for like a chorus idea, I'll, I'll go through those recordings and see like, oh, wow, that actually totally, totally. you know, if I transpose it, that, that might make sense in the song. Um, yeah. And so not to mention the fact that like what's, ba what's bad sometimes is a matter of context, right? Like it's a terrible yeah. lyric, but some of that has to do with what's around it or it's, or like it's a progression that just doesn't fly, but that has to yeah. do with the rest of the song around it. Oh, absolutely. And th there's there's been mo multiple songs where there's like a lyric that I just I really like and I really just want to fit it in no matter what, <laughs> yeah. even if it doesn't belong there. Yeah. And, it, uh, you know, a week or two of wrestling it, then I'll kind of let it go. And then it, it always does find a way into another song. So I, cool. I kind of there's a there's a there's a process that I feel like 
gives you know anything that's anything that's true or that I feel like was an honest part of myself, it, it will show up in another song. So <laughs> I just always have to remind myself, like, okay, if, if I'm if I'm saying no to this song, this this part of that song right now, it doesn't mean I'm throwing in the garbage. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, but yeah, so that's that's kind of like the 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 bare bones structure. Sometimes that goes along very very nicely and very easily. Um, that's actually not true. It never does. <laughs> I need to stop myself right there. That is, that is not true. Um, they always are, you know, different levels of, of challenging. <laughs> yeah. Um, but sometimes like every once in a while, if I'm working on something on the piano, um, just doing that kind of like free, free playing, I will, I will come up with something right on the spot that I'm really excited about. So mm. sometimes it'll, you know, it'll bypass that whole record and collect process and, um, and it'll just turn into something right away. That's, I prefer that. Right. <laughs> that yes. would be, that's way more fun. Um, but usually it takes taking that, that little, <clears throat> like that inspired piece and sitting on it for a while and coming back and realizing, yeah, maybe that's not. As perfect oh, yeah. as this felt when I got it out the first time. Exactly. Oh, the, that's like one of the worst feelings ever is when you work on something for a while and you're so excited that you finally have something and then you go to sleep and the next day it's just, it's not good. <laughs> one of my favorite moments, is, uh, one of these, <clears throat> one of these uh, songwriting getaways is a young man came in and he was fired up about this song and he had submitted it ahead of time to this panel and we had all listened to the song, the folks on the panel and, and it wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't terrible. It just wasn't very good. And so he got some okay. critique on the song. <laughs> And he stood up in the middle of this general session, like I'm, I'm, I'm up front on the panel of the songwriters, and this this one gentleman who had actually written the critique, who's like really, really tremendous songwriter, and it, and it was very, it was a generous critique, but he basically said that it's not that great a song, and here are some things to think about. And the kid stands up, he's probably you know 19, and <clears> he's <throat> he's like, I cannot believe you wrote this. And the guy was like, well, uh, what are you what are you talking? He's like, the, the, the things you wrote about my song. And he's like, well, I, you know, I felt like the bridge was a little bit detached, didn't feel like it was part of the song, felt that, you know, the, the melody sort of wanders a little bit. And he says, no, but like, how could you critique? And they says this. It was unbelievable. He goes, I felt like I was given this song in a dream. It was like God gave me this song. And this brother. So good. The guy on the panel, the guy who critiqued the song says, well, that might be true. Have you considered the fact that God might have given you the song so that you could fix it? And uh, <laughs> it's like it's like oh yeah, just just because you're inspired to it doesn't mean that that has to be the end of the of the process. Absolutely, yeah, totally. <laughs> So you and I have a mutual friend in uh, in uh, Mike Busby, uh, yes, who's absolutely. a great guy, and he was he was part of uh, season one of the podcast. Oh, and, cool! And one of the things that that, that Busby and I talked about was um, this sort of uh, like an emotional detachment, almost like a discipline that over the course of time you go through as an artist, where you create something and you have a personal attachment to it. And like you were saying with a lot of the songs. Uh, especially early on, that was like the, the sort of the the um, the thematic tie between sleeping at last as a band and you as sleeping at last is like these are your songs and they're personal to you and well then you you create something and then you pass it on and and whether it's a listener or whoever they take it in their own lives and they sort of interpret it for their own circumstances and you you definitely want you know at times you want to have folks think like yeah this is what i want you know you want folks to, to hear what you want them to hear in a song and then there's that kind of relinquishing of that to some degree you have yeah. this whole other thing though uh that i'd love to hear you talk about well you'll you'll create something and then it'll be used uh in someone else's art uh so <laughs> you'll write it you'll write a song and then it ends up on a television show and they're using that to create a like a completely different moment Right, That's right, got to right. be a little bit awkward or unusual uh, at first to, to th like, because you've got a context in which those lyrics w were written. 
And then they're in this other context and with these characters. Can you talk about that experience a little bit? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I think I'm, I was pretty young when I realized like, Oh, okay. When I put something in a song, it, it's pretty much guaranteed that somebody else is going to hear it differently. <laughs> like, and I actually, so for some reason I've always kind of loved that about like, I, I've never, I don't know, I guess um, I've always appreciated a little bit more abstract writing where it can still be completely personal to the person that wrote it, but at the same time, it, it takes on, you know, it, it can have even more opportunity to take on another life um, in somebody else's circumstance or somebody else's ears. So it almost felt like it was kind of filling in some like, oh, interesting, I, 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 like how beautiful that hmm. somebody could hear that message out of what I was trying to say, which is totally about this, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So yeah. I always, I always, I, I get excited about that stuff. Um, but it is a, it is a surreal thing. I mean, because the fir- the very first time my my song got used in a TV show was on a it was, I think in two thousand and three or something like that, and it was on a, 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 sh- a Warner Brothers show called Tarzan that was like a live action version of Tarzan in the city. Wow! <laughs> it was it was a very um, I think it had like four I mi- episodes. I, I missed I missed that. I didn't. <laughs> you uh, might have missed that. I might have missed that. But I, I remember getting the call and being like, oh my gosh, like finally it's happening. And I'm yeah. like, like my music's going to be a part of a TV show. It's going to be so cool. I didn't, I didn't know of, the, of that show, but we, we were on tour and we, we, you know, we were in our hotel room waiting for the episode to air. And so of course it starts airing and we're like all trying to tune in and listen to it as like closely as we can. Cause we don't know where, what scene it's going to be in. And then of course, like in the very, towards the end of the episode, there's like in the background, it literally is on like a radio in the background of whatever scene is happening. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I wrote this song and I could not tell it was my song. <laughs> like, so it was good. so faint and so back there that I was just like, oh, no, wait, no, wait. I think we must have missed it. We must have missed it. And then, uh, you know, of course, it ends. And then we, we call the record label and they're like, yeah, 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 it was on there. Yeah, there and they is. did like a little advertisement at the end of the episode that said like music tonight by blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so that was my first uh, impression of that stuff. And then I think my second placement was um, – probably a year or two later on Grey's Anatomy. And um, they, I think they used, uh, it was a little bit more. So it, I felt like my my music over the last um, decade has kind of slowly come from that background place to being a little bit more front and center in the emotional territory. <laughs> so, yeah. But that, that, that set that like, um, that second placement of Grey's Anatomy was like, it, it was also just, it was like, I think 20, 20 or 30 seconds in the background. And, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't tell anything that was going on in the song. It was just like texture, like wallpaper. <laughs> yeah. And so, so, um, but yeah, so I, I, in that context, then it doesn't really, you know, it, it's just a mood. But when, when they, when TV shows will use my stuff that actually like you can, that the lyric is prominent and kind of, speaks to a little bit of the scene I, I i just get so excited about that it seems like such a such a cool way to um for those two art you know pieces of art to merge yeah Interpretation and and uh, I have really enjoyed your your covers projects. Uh, the there there are two of them now, uh, <laughs> volume one and vo- volume two. What did you the, is this stuff like in terms of how you select the songs? Is this stuff that you grew up listening to? Is this like how are you selecting songs? Like like <clears throat> what makes you want to cover a song? So every single song of those on the projects were actually commissioned from either like Grey's Anatomy or different um, advertising oh, opportunities. Really? Like I had a I had a, um, a Mercedes commercial recently, so they they specifically asked if I would cover this Bob Dylan song, and 
<clears throat> so actually every single one of those was a commission um, in, to some degree. I think there was one song, I think you've got a friend in me from uh, from Toy Story, which was just something I really wanted to do. And I was right. I was playing a show um, at, uh, at Disneyland last year and it was so, I, I'm, I'm such a huge Disney fan and Pixar fan that I, I knew at that show I wanted to record yeah. or I wanted to perform some some cover of a Disney song. Yeah. And uh, and so I did that one. And then as soon as I got home, I, I recorded it for real to, for this for this covers project. But other than that, they're all they're all um, requested. You know, would you cover this song? Because yeah, it, it was a really fun thing. Like so, I've never. Uh, with the exception of recording a Christmas song every year, I never did covers up until the last few years. Um, I just never, I just never was interested in, in uh, doing anything outside of writing my own stuff. Hmm. And then, so I think it was Grey's Anatomy was the first for that um, my cover of 500 Miles, that Proclaimer song. They were trying something new out in the show, and they they had used a bunch of my music, and they were sweet enough to to invite me to record that song. And I was just like, oh, I, I know that song, but it seems so like so outside of my uh yeah. my comfort zone not, that's not your bag of chips <laughs> not totally not totally like i i don't i don't write silly like like happy songs not silly but like like fun songs are not my thing <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> i hope that people can enjoy my music but i wouldn't call them fun songs there's usually there's usually a little bit of a, a sadder <laughs> yeah a sadder uh posture i guess like a melancholy. In the music, but <clears throat> exactly. So um, when they asked me to do that, I was like, oh, yeah, I can totally try to do that. And um, so I just decided, I'm like, all right, how do how would I take this song apart and how would I like process it? And it turns out that that song is such a beautiful love song. And I never would have heard that before in the original version. I never paid attention close enough. So that became like a, the beginning of me really, really enjoying kind of taking these songs apart that are that are from the 80s or um, so I think there's a couple 90s songs in there, too. And um, yeah. so it's been really, really fun to kind of like reimagine them um in in the genre of music that i enjoy and yeah. then also kind of like take apart that songwriting and, and be really blown away by some of the um especially that song was such a such a sweet <laughs> such a sweet love song totally um so yeah so all of those are commissions and um they were they were a lot of fun my my wife is a uh an art major, a uh, visual art major, a cool. studio art major in college. And one of the things we talked talked about a, a number of times is the difference between uh, like master studies as a as a discipline and a practice with visual artists and oh, the, yeah. and the sort of reluctance among musicians to do similar things that I, I, you know, I've heard interviews with Bob Dylan about, you know, the lack of actual originality that there's no there's really no such thing as a, as a <laughs> fully original song. You're stealing something from someone all the time. Yep. But this the, the whole notion of like a master study is you actually you full blown paint something else of someone else's or you sculpt something of someone else's or you you shoot it exactly the way you do it. And by doing so, you sort of learn like how does he how, how, how does he get that color without this or how does how does she get these angles? And you sort of yeah. have to do it the way they do it has has doing. Have you been shaped at all? Can you point at ways that like doing the covers has affected the way you've approached this newer batch of songs? Yeah, definitely. Like even there's like types of chord structures or um, moods or even like a key change or two that I would never, ever in my brain think to uh, even explore in writing a song. And so I've been really excited to kind of like as I'm learning each of these each of these covers for for different projects, it's been really fun to kind of like see like, I don't know, see that 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 architecture in mm. the song. Yeah. Um, cause it just, and I don't know of a direct way that it, it has like changed my thinking, but even some new chords that I just don't typically, uh, gravitate towards, like it, it is, it, it has created those as options yeah, that's <laughs> cool. know, in my, uh, my, in my chord arsenal. Um, but yeah, so it it has, and I, I think even the it also has like taught me to listen a little bit closer to stuff that's on the radio and stuff that may not be in like the the mood that I'm typically like a fan of. Right. I think it's given me a, a greater appreciation of like, oh yeah, so there's like, and I I already kind of knew this, but I it, it's given me a little bit more of a, a application to you know when I hear something to really really listen. Yeah.
So and we've, we've come up a couple times with <clears> sort of the, the mood or the, the, the sort of tone, the sort of the melancholy, because there really is sort of a general melancholy <laughs> that, that, that ties together. It's like the rug that ties together the room uh, <laughs> yeah, it, of your of your work as an artist. Is there really, there's, there's, a, there's a melancholy that, that's there. And even in, you know, the songs, uh, um, uh, like a, a song like Jupiter, that is, yeah. it's a, it's, it's, it, it stops somewhere short of being like this triumphant song. It's a powerful song, and there's a joyfulness in it, but there it's still yeah. like this melancholy that keeps, <laughs> that keeps yeah. from like letting it explode into the, into the stratosphere. Yeah. Where did, are do, are you a melancholy person? Is that something? No, I don't. I don't like, think where so. does it, where does it come like... from then that, that <laughs> this is happening to you? I don't really know. Um, I think it might just be like, uh, so there's, uh, so I, as part of my Atlas series, I just finished uh, four songs for the four basic human emotions. And so obviously writing sorrow was super easy. <laughs> fit, fit <laughs> That's super good. Well. But I knew, I knew actually when I mapped out this Atlas project that there was going to be a song called joy and it had to not be melancholy <laughs> and that was that was a little bit daunting it was um, looming in so, the distance coming at you like oh, it totally was it and so even that song which is kind of has this uh you know this joyful sound and um production and kind of the whole like the lyrics are happy everything's a little bit um brighter and sweeter than my than my yeah. normal thing and but i i cannot help it there's always a sad chord <laughs> yeah which is like it's it's exactly like what you said with Jupiter, where it's like it's almost it's gonna no nope, it's, nope. it's a little sad. It's <laughs> well, even the, sad. even even like this the artwork <clears throat> for the single of Joy. I mean, it's like it's it's, it's this yeah. almost entirely grayed out, and you can't tell if that's actually the sun. Is it setting or rising? <laughs> I mean, it's like so. It's like so. It's, it's this, you know, sleeping at last, Joy, and and you're like, yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Comparatively, a, but it really, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. All it's context. all a matter of context, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, it, it's a beautiful it, song. But it really, does, it's still like, even that song, "Joy." You're like, this is man. his take on joy, and this is what it, it's totally what it feels is. like. This is this is what joy sounds like to a generally melancholy person. Um, but no, I'm, I'm not actually like I wouldn't. I don't think people that know me would would say like, oh yeah, he's a super sad dude. No, <laughs> I just I think it's just the um, so when I was when I was getting into like understanding music when I was probably like, I don't know, 10, I would start to notice, you know, I, I bought my first CD and I think it was, uh, I think it was Lion King was my, was my very first CD that I wow. ever purchased and <clears throat> was pretty, pretty excited. And I noticed that after buying CDs for a little while that like, oh my gosh, on every album, there was this one song that kind of gave you goosebumps or gave you the, the, gave you the chills. And I was so like, obsessed with that idea and that like music that could do that that was more emotional and i think that's where it kind of it comes from like i just and that always i mean not that it, i guess uplifting music can do that same thing too but yeah. for some reason the the more emotional um uh the song and the more ballad <laughs> ballad-esque that it is um the that I, like i just I was always like surprised as I grew up, like, like, okay, so there's always like one or two songs on every album that did that, but I want to like, I want to make an album that has that in like every song. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was my goal. I don't think I've done it, but like that, that was sort of a, another, another bit of criteria for, for writing a song. Like at some point in the writing, did it give me goosebumps? Like at some, at some moments. And mm. if so, then it's worth, it's worth pursuing. But if not, then some, something's broken in my song. Well, and there's something a little bit, I mean, not a little bit, there's something really deeply human about about that tension because, I mean, it, like, lyrically, especially what you're doing with with the Atlas project that, I, I at least to me, is is pretty clear. I mean, thematically, they're, like, the theme of light versus darkness that yeah. is, like, abundantly present. And that there's this, uh, a character that, whether it's you or not, there's this sort of character that is trying to intentionally pass on hope to another character in yeah, yeah. these songs like like it's over and over and over so you get this this lightness this like the sort of hope for hope if not hope itself thing yeah. happening in in the songs and <clears throat> lines about sort of the the joy of existence would like and this is not a trap question and, and so no. there, and they may not be an answer to it but is there like do you have a sense that you <clears throat> are uh, are you up to something like, is there a thing, like, is there something you would hope to have happen in the hearts and the minds and the lives of your listeners? Like, as much as, like, yeah, certainly you want to just do as you learn to do. Like, I'm going to put my nose down and take care of my yeah. art and then let what happens on the other side of that happen. 
Well, the other side of that coin is, I mean, something in you clearly in these songs like wants something for someone else. Is there is there yeah, something absolutely. you hope to have happen in the hearts, the minds, and the <clears throat> lives of listeners with your music? Totally. And so a lot, of, most of the songs are sort of almost written to me, okay. <laughs> like, cause like anything that has a lesson in it is basically me trying to tell myself, like, uh, it's, it's like self therapy almost. All right. <clears throat> um, but I, I've noticed, I noticed when I started writing songs that like, no matter how sad they can get, I, all, there's always like a little bit of hope in, in my lyrics. And I don't know if that's, uh, if if that's for if, if that's intentional or not, I don't think it is because there's actually been a few songs that I've tried intentionally, kind of leave it more open ended because I wanted it to be more you know, not all not all sorrow and and sadness feels like you know acknowledges the existence of hope sometimes. Hmm. So I wanted to be really real with that. But no matter no matter what I do, like that it somehow finds its way in like the last lyric. <laughs> huh. and so I don't know. I don't know what that is. And I think that the last, uh, the last few projects I've sort of just leaned into that and I've, I've, I've let that be like, yeah, I'm, I'm proud that that, that, that exists there. So if a listener listens to any, anything that I'm writing, um, that, that, that is like, what a, what a, you know, if the, the one thing that I want them to pull away from it is that hope exists, you know, like mm-hmm. in whatever situation. So I, I, but again, I don't think it's very intentional. Like, so every song I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to, especially with these theme songs, I'm trying to kind of, on one hand, write in my journal, and then on the other hand, uh, write in my journal in such a way that makes sense with this interpretation of a theme. You know, whether it's, whether it's one of the emotions or um, one of the planets, or you know, all these different kind of conceptual yeah. um, themes throughout the project. But so. I'm trying to kind of do both things at once, but I, I do think that there's, I think you're totally right that there's, there's this, there's this character <laughs> that is kind of, that is like a, that is an optimist that's kind of stuck in my melancholy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So do you have, so like, right, right on the glass, like press, his nose pressed against the glass being like, it's out there. <laughs> there it is. That's actually a great image. It's hard me the courage of stars. Before you left, how light carries on endlessly, even after death. With shortness of breath, you explain. And so do you, do you have like a sense of li- listenership? So like you haven't been on the road a whole ton for a while. Like you're not a touring artist. No. Nope. So your your relationship with your audience, which, which you do have, mm-hmm. is uh, pretty dramatically different than someone who's going to see their audience, you know, 150, 200 times a year. Right, right, right. Totally. Do you have a sense of your listenership as you're writing, uh, or is that like a ne- another part of the process? In other words, are you conscious of the people who who will be like consuming what you're making as you're making it, or is that yeah, totally. is that a, like a secondary? It is. It is. It is secondary. But one of the gifts of being able to like write and record something quickly and then put it out there into the world, like, is you get you get immediate feedback. So rather than huh. you know saving up twelve songs for an album and then you put it all out there and you're like, all right, how how am I doing, guys? Um, this is you know especially because Atlas is uh, even right in this year or two that I'm working on is all singles. So as soon as I finish a song, it comes out. Um, and I love uh, like the the kind of immediate feedback of that has been really really great like, but it is it is secondary in the sense that I'm not like waiting for people to um, to respond in a specific way yeah. to it and I'm also trying not to let any negative feedback really influence what I'm doing either which I'm grateful that there hasn't been too many I'm sure there there will be now if anybody listens to this <laughs> yeah you, like, <laughs> you know oh, here's my permission that guy sucks um, <laughs> <clears throat> but but so but it is really 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 uh, gratifying to be able to finish something and put it out there and kind of 
hear how people connect to it right away. Mm. I feel like that refuels me to write that next song. So in that way, it's been it's been super helpful and awesome. But um, while I'm writing it, I'm not I'm not really thinking about who who I'm writing it for. I'm almost thinking just how how can I stay true with it and how can I how can I say something that I'm meaning and mm. um, and yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the times too is it's definitely me like working things out in my life <laughs> yeah. through, through these songs. Like I said, it's self therapy. Yeah. So <clears throat> it is a lot of that. And, um, I think that when it comes down to like the, the carpentry of it, like the actual building the song and, and recording it and producing it and all that kind of stuff, then, then I start thinking about like the quality of the work and trying yeah. to figure out like, okay, does this make sense? Does this, you know, is this suit the song as best as it can? And I ask those questions, which are more, I guess, um, which are more, I guess, informed by uh, people hearing it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, but yeah, I, I, since I don't tour, you're right though. Like I have, I have less of a, less of like a personal face to face with with people that listen to my music, um, which is definitely a bummer. But I, I do try to do like spot dates here and there, and that does um, bring that back. And I will be, I will be touring again sometime soon. But this Atlas project has kept me, kept me mostly in the studio all year long. So. Oh, Because you started in, in 99, uh, you got to experience what a lot of us did. I think you and I are roughly the same age, and I think I've had a, a sort of a similar uh, kind of arc with this particular part of the music world, is yeah. in 99, 2000, people did this thing called, they, they would <laughs> buy these things called CDs. And now a CD so is a, <laughs> CD is a, it's a, it's a piece of, and, and they put the music on the, anyways, uh, but <laughs> Whereas now, like folks don't buy music the way they used to buy music, and there's a ton yeah. of, uh, or ha maybe not as much as there used to be, but there's a there has been a lot of grief uh, for for artists, musician types, songwriters who've been around for a long time, and like my gosh, what am I gonna do? Um, as can you talk about your experience of like that the shifting that shifting marketplace that that yeah. there was a time when you you <clears throat> create something. And like you said, the format was there. You had twelve songs, and someone would buy it for between twelve and sixteen dollars, and that's how that transaction worked. And then went from that to where we are at now, where I'm paying, you know, whether it's three ninety nine for my for the you know Pandora or it's nine ninety nine a month, but I'm not <clears throat> giving you direct money. Like, how has that changed yeah, yeah, yeah. your relationship with an audience? How's that changed relationship to your your relationship to your own work? Like, what's that arc been like for you? Yeah, totally. So it is it is super fascinating how quickly everything has kind of shifted. Because when I when I started, I got signed to uh, Interscope Records, which was a major label, and they still are doing great um, great stuff. But they are uh, that was like that was like the ultimate goal as a kid growing up is like, Oh my gosh, if I sign a record label, like I will have made it. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't matter if, if it doesn't matter if the record just sits there or <laughs> does nothing. I, I, I reached some sort of milestone. So, right. um, that was like my mindset going into it was like, Oh my gosh, like this huge validation of this, you know, the thing that I love doing most making music. And that came pretty early. I was probably 17, 18 years old when I got signed to that record label. And I think I pretty quickly realized, um, that I, I just love being hands-on. So, um, I, I, everything from like how the poster tour poster looks to t-shirts. And, um, I, I just want the whole, the whole package of sleeping at last to be represented, um, in a very specific way. So, and that's, that's, that's sometimes very difficult with a the label. They were really, really, really cool with, with, with us and with what we wanted and the music turned out exactly the way we wanted. And, um, there was never any compromise with that, which I feel so grateful for, but even still, I realized pretty early that, um, after the record came out, they're like, Oh, okay. I don't, I don't think I like waiting for, you know, 18 people to approve 
a poster <laughs> or whatever it is. Right. Um, and so my manager was like, you should totally go back to being independent and we should, we should focus on being an independent project. And I was totally terrified of that. Cause that was against every childhood dream that I had. I'm like, no, no, but major label. <laughs> right. Um, but it ended up being, I think the smartest thing that, uh, could have happened to, to my career. So from that point on, which was, I think, 2004, I was an independent artist and, and decided to just focus on, uh, on, on doing things completely on my own. So when, when the music, uh, kind of, uh, industry changed and kind of ended up being completely opposite of, of how it, uh, how, you know, I, I came into it as, um, it was just a really natural thing. So every tool that came out when iTunes came out, it was, it was perfectly timed for me being an independent musician. Cause then I could, I had all of a sudden I had the keys to distributing my own music, you know, yeah. <laughs> like that was, that's what you needed a label for. And then as iTunes got more successful and, um, uh, online distribution just got a little bit, uh, a little wider with all these different stores opening up. So then when Spotify came out of the scene more recently, I, it, again, for me as an independent, it, it, no matter what opportunities or what, whatever, uh, how many listeners I have, I'm always excited about more people being able to hear it and more just the opportunity to, to share my songs with, with other people has been, has been huge. So I, Spotify created their own, um, their own culture of music listeners mm -hmm. and YouTube, yeah. I think has this is a very similar thing where people, people exclusively listen to music on YouTube sometimes, which I did not know that w was even a thing until like last year. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it, I, it was the same, same. It was, and it was strange to pay attention to I me. Mean, like yeah. I would have never, I've n I would have never <laughs> gone there, but apparently yeah. a lot apparently, of folks are. Yeah. There's a, there's so many people that are. And so I, I've, like wholeheartedly embrace all of the new technology and all of the new formats that in ways people listen to music. I think it's, I think it's crazy for anybody to be like trying to fight against it just because technology is so quickly moving forward that it's it like music in, in the, the formats of CDs or even MP3s and like mm -hmm. it, all that stuff is, is pretty much outdated. Like the, two years after it comes out. So it seems crazy to be surprised where music is heading. Um, so I've always been super excited about it. And um, as an example, like Spotify has been an incredible source of revenue for me. And it's also been an incredible uh, source of finding new audience for me. So every yeah. time I've gotten anything on a TV show or a commercial or a movie, um, uh, I, I find that people go to Spotify first to see where, you know, to, to find what song that was and <laughs> with the help of Shazam and all this stuff. So I, I, I just get really excited about it. I heard, um, there's this quote, I think it was Hans Zimmer that was saying it. Um, and I think he was saying is no matter what happens with technology, you know, if, if the whole world just changes overnight, uh, if you look at history, there's always going to be room for storytelling and there's always going to be room for music. And I feel like yeah. that's super true. So I get really excited to see kind of where, what music's place is going to be in, in all these new, uh, these new ways that people consume music. Well, man, thanks a ton for your time. Appreciate it. <laughs> oh my gosh. My, my pleasure. Thanks for talking. Thank you for listening. If you like what I'm doing with the podcast, and I hope you do, please leave a positive review at iTunes. That actually makes a significant difference, particularly with new listeners or potential listeners. And consider supporting this work by visiting patreon.com and searching my name. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash Justin McRoberts. I'd appreciate having you on the team. You can check out any of our previous conversations uh, by visiting at podcast, A-T-S-E-A podcast.com. Ryan's work, all of it is available if you visit um, sleepingatlast.com, including uh, the Atlas series. I think he's 15 songs into this 25 song journey. It's something, it's really something special. You should definitely go check that out. Until next time.